Okay, so welcome back to Shara Bitochen of Salvovis. This is the fourth class. We started Monday night. We started at the beginning of this week. It's been uh, quite a journey. We are not going to take questions at the beginning of this class. Baruch Hashem, questions continue to come in. And if you have questions, please email me directly at rabbi at soulwords.org. And Emir uh, Hashem, I will deal with the questions uh, in this class. But uh, tonight we're not going to do any questions because we want to get through a large part of text. It's a somewhat challenging uh, stretch, and uh, I want to be able to push through and, and finish it. So let me tell you what we're up to. We're up to an extended analogy from Rabbeinu Bechaya about an alchemist. Now, here's the thing. What, what a marshal, an analogy, why is it effective? Because it takes something that's unfamiliar and it compares it to something that's familiar. And then you build a bridge from the familiar to the unfamiliar and you, and you learn something new by learning about something you already related to. That's what makes a marshal so effective as a teaching tool. The marshal here is about alchemists. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't find that to be the most relatable uh, reference in my day-to-day life. So I think we need to explain a little bit before we jump into the whole alchemy thing what the metaphor really is. First of all, what is alchemy? <laughs> it, it, it's, it's an English word that comes from an Arabic word, alchemia, which Allah is like, you know, uh, the in Arabic. Kemia is chemistry. So alchemy is really just chemistry, and alchemy originally was just primitive chemistry. But then it became known as specifically the uh, attempt to turn more common metals into precious metals, or even more specifically, to turn lead into gold. And uh, many, many great thinkers throughout the ages pursued the goal of making this transformation of metals. In fact, Sir Isaac Newton, who's, who invented calculus and discovered the law of gravity, one of the greatest thinkers, much of the work that he did in many of his writings, a great deal of his writings, were in alchemy. Um, so w- w- what's an alchemist? An alchemist is a guy who can turn lead into gold. Okay. So in 2020, what does that mean? You ever heard the expression, Maybe someone was describing a business opportunity to you and they said, man, this is, this is a great deal. It's, 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 it's like a license to print money. You ever heard that expression? It's like a license to print money. What does that mean? It means that you, you, you're going to be rich. There's no limit to the wealth that you're going to be. It's going to be so lucrative. Well, if you were successful at alchemy, if you could actually turn lead into gold, then... Um, you would literally have a license to print money. You could just make as much gold as you want, and you'd be unlimitedly wealthy. So that would basically be a great situation. So now think about an alchemist as a guy who has this racket where he's able to basically generate unlimited wealth. Amazing, right? Okay? An alchemist is like a guy (laughs) in his garage with his two Ferraris and his bookshelf. If you get the reference, you get the reference. (laughs) Anyways... This guy, he's got it made, right? Okay, so an alchemist, that's like a really amazing thing to be. Everyone would think, you know, if I'd be an alchemist, then life would be great. I could just make as much gold as I wanted. Okay, now, if you look at it that way, then, now, here's why this is a great marshal. Because imagine you're speaking to people who think, you know, that the best possible setup you could ever have would be to be a successful alchemist. And someone would come to you and say, you know, it's good to trust in Hashem. You say, really? How good is it to trust in Hashem? Real good. Yeah, how good? Uh, well, you know how good? Better than being an alchemist. Really? Well, being an alchemist is like the coolest thing I could imagine. This is even better than that. In fact, in 10 ways. And that's what we're going to learn tonight. Rabbeinu Bahaya explains <clears throat> how trusting in Hashem is better than being an alchemist in 10 ways. Okay. <clears throat> 
inside the text of Mayhem, and among the advantages of having Bitochen in Hashem, Shahabaytech Belakim, Yivyehu, Bitchene Lefanes es Libai, Minyanehel Elam. His trust in Hashem brings him, enables him to be able to turn away from mundane matters. And to focus, to concentrate on what really matters, on, on serving Hashem. And he will be in his tranquility and his wide heart and his minimal worry. He'll be similar to an alchemist. We just explained what that means. The alchemist, he doesn't have a care in the world, or at least so we think, because he's got it made. He's got it made. He's an alchemist. He can turn lead into gold. Okay. And you know what? The guy with betoching, he's even better off than an alchemist. Vuhu, and what is an alchemist? Vuhu ha-yedeya lahafech ha-kasef lezohov v'hanecheshes v'habdil l'kasef ha-yedei chokmo ma'isa. He's a guy who can transform metals. Okay. V'im hu chozik b'bit chayne belakim. And if he is strong in his trust in Hashem, Yeshle all of Yisrael Basar Devarim, he he actually has ten advantages. How he's better off than an alchemist? Wow! How can you get better than an alchemist? I'll tell you right now. Okay. Chilasam Shabal hu alkamia tzarech lidvarim yuchadim lamlocha lo yigmer lo yidaver zulasam. First of all, the alchemist needs certain special materials. Philosopher's Stone, in case you're into alchemy. That's the thing that you need to do. Alchemy is called the Philosopher's Stone. Okay. Anyways, kids, don't try this at home. No alchemy. Or if you do, ask your parents first. Okay. So the, the alchemist, he has special materials that he needs in order to do his alchemy. And he doesn't find these materials at all times and in all places. So he's got a license to print money, but sometimes the, the printing machine doesn't work, right? He can turn lead into gold, but sometimes he doesn't have the, the materials he needs. And if he doesn't have his materials, then he can't do his alchemy. However, someone who trusts in Hashem, his sustenance is promised to him from all the causes of the causes of the world. In other words, Hashem's running the world. He can figure it out. Hashem runs the supply chain. He'll figure out how to orchestrate everything in the whole world to make sure to deliver you with what you need. Like it says, to let you know, a person doesn't just live on bread. No, it's not bread that you're living on. Rather, you are sustained, you are living on the divine speech. Hashem is working it out that you should get your sustenance. He explains a little bit more on this. Because the means toward getting a livelihood are never withheld from him, from the person who has trust in Hashem. They are never withheld from him at any time or in any place. Like we know from the story about Elioah Navi. Im with the ravens, the imo isha ho almona, and with the widow, the ugas ratzofim v'tzapachas amayim, and the baked loaves of bread, and the and the uh, cruise of water, udvar evadya, and also about the prophet evadya, ima neviim he hid some prophets that were being persecuted by the king shaamar like it says, vo achbi minevia Hashem mea ish. I hid a hundred of Hashem's prophets, fifty to a cave, and I provided them with bread and water. What's, what's this referring to, the story of Elio? Elio had to run away. Ochov, the wicked king, Ochov, wanted his life, so he had to run. Hashem told him to run. And he ran away, and how was he going to eat? So ravens came, and ravens brought him food. So the Gemara in Chulin says that these ravens, where did they get the food from to feed Elio? They took food from Achav's kitchen, from the royal kitchen, from the palace, and they flew it to Elio. In other words, if you're relying on Hashem to take care of you, Hashem's got the whole world under control. If he needs to use ravens, he'll use ravens. If he needs UPS, he'll use UPS, FedEx, whatever he needs. Hashem's running the whole world. There's no None of the sea bites are withheld from him. He can work it out. 
he'll deliver you your parnosa, and he's much more reliable than any other means for getting your parnosa because he runs everything. You know, um, there's something called the Jewish Recovery Center in Boca Raton in Florida, and they make a retreat. And uh, I've been to the retreat maybe two or three times. I can't remember how many times, but uh, very, very nice retreat, very inspiring for, for Jews in recovery and their families. Anyways, well, there's a guest that's usually there. Maybe he's there every time, but there's a guest that's at the Jewish Recovery Center retreat, a comedian named Sarge. And uh, he's a Jewish guy, not a religious guy, but Jewish, proud of his Jewish identity and uh, in recovery. And he's open about that. And uh, he's a comedian. So he talks about, one of the things that just hit me, really just resonated with me, is he talks about how, you know, he's in show business. And uh, being in show business, not like having a regular nine to five job. It's not like you have a paycheck, a regular, you know, uh, salary. You get called to work, and if you get called to work, then you get paid. If you don't get called to work, then you don't get paid. So in show business, people, you always need to be present. You always need to be showing your face. You always need to be making sure that you're on the radar, that people know about you, that they're thinking about you. That's why you need an agent. You need a, you need a, 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 a press team and publicity, a, pu- a, a publicist. And, and, and so he said he was living out in L.A. because, of course, you want to be successful in, sh- in, in show business. You have to live in L.A. There's no choice. You have to. That's the Aveda Zoda, right? You have to live in L.A. And finally, he decided, you know what? I, I don't want to be in L.A. I'm from Florida. I want to move back to Florida. So he, he moved back to Boynton Beach. Boynton Beach is not exactly the capital of, uh, of show business, of entertainment. So he says, I get more calls for gigs living in Boynton Beach, where I'm happy, than, the, than when I was in Hollywood and I was hustling that every uh, producer should know me and should see me. He says, because you know why? My higher power knows my address. <laughs> Beautiful. My higher power knows my address. What? I have to be in Hollywood? I have to be out in L.A.? Or, or, or Hashem won't know how to send me what he needs to send me? Trust me, he can find me in Boynton Beach. He can find me wherever I go. Don't worry, my higher power has my address. Anyways, I thought that was that was beautiful. <clears throat> and that's what Rabbeinu B'chai is saying here, is that the alchemist, he needs certain things that you can only get at certain times in certain places. The person who's relying on Hashem, there's no scarcity. The resources will come to you wherever, whenever. Hashem will make sure to deliver it to you. Okay. The Yomer, and it says, Kfirm Roshu Varoivu Vader Shashem Liyachsu Chotev. Young lions, well, young lions are the, those, those are like the king of the jungle. And they're young, they're healthy, and uh, they should be able to get everything they want, right? It's a metaphor for, you know, people who look like they can accomplish whatever they want. But they're hungry, they're roaring because they're hungry, but those who trust in Hashem, they won't lack any good. We said that at the end of benching. The Yomer, and it says, Yiruas Hashem Kideshov, Kiein Machse Lereyov. We also say that at the end of benching. Fear Hashem, you his consecrated ones, for those who fear him lack nothing. Point number two how the one who trusts in Hashem is better off than an alchemist. Point number two. The Hasheni. Kibal Hakmiya Tsarichlam Aisim, Vlamalochis, La Yushlam Le Hefze Zulasam. The alchemist needs to do certain actions, procedures, without which he cannot accomplish his purpose. The Avsher, and it's possible, Shemesuhu Reicham, Vashonam, Im Hasmodas Vaveda, Vaerich Yegia Bohem Laila Vayema. But it's possible, you know what might happen? That he may die as a result of the odors and the fumes, along with the incessant labor and protracted toil by day and by night. So, yeah, he can turn lead into gold. That seems like he's got it made. But you know what? The, when, you're, you're, when you're working in the lab, in your alchemy lab, and you're breathing those fumes, you're endangering yourself. It's dangerous work in order to get that gold. However, However, <laughs> 
whatever, but rather the one who trusts in Hashem is safe from harm and can rest assured that no evil will befall him. And whatever comes to him from Hashem brings him joy and gladness. He obtains his livelihood with peace of mind, calm and tranquility. Like it says in Tehillim, Bines Desha Yabitseni Almei Menuchos Nahaleni. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He guides me beside calm waters. It's an important point here. It says that whatever comes to him, that he receives it with joy and gladness. It is to him l'sosein v'lesimcha. I think that's an important point because Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar is not promising that everything's going to be exactly as you wanted it to be. It's not that because you thought it had to be a certain way, and that's the best that you can dream for yourself, that that really is the best. Sometimes Hashem has better plans for you. But if you have trust in Hashem and you know that He's always working things out for your best, then even when things happen in a way that it doesn't seem like you're getting what you want, or maybe you're not getting what you want, but what you wanted isn't the best, so you have trust and you realize, you know what, let's wait this thing out. Gamzula Teva. And, and, and let's wait it out, and let's see. So even when you don't get what you think you ought to be getting, even that, you're happy. You're unworried. Okay. Ba'ashli, she in the third way. Ki ba'al akmiya ene maimin al soide zulase. The alchemist doesn't trust his secret to anyone else. It's like, it's like the formula for Coca-Cola. Cannot trust anybody. Miyarose al nafshe. Why? He actually he fears for his life. They're going to kill him. Bahabeteach belakim. However, the one who trusts in Hashem, his security comes from Hashem. Enenu yore mishum adam ibitchenei. He's not afraid of people. What are you going to do to me? Steal my bitachin? <laughs> See, the alchemist, he's afraid they're going to steal his alchemy stuff. They're going to get his philosopher's stone. They're going to get his laboratory. Uh. The Beteach Basha, what are you going to do? You're going to steal my, you're going to break in at night and steal my Betochen? There's a story. There was a chassid, Reb Mendel Futterfass. And he was sent to a gulag, to a Siberian uh, forced labor, a prison. And uh, in the prison with him, there was a professor. And I'm not sure what he was a professor of, but some type of an intellectual professor. And uh, this professor, one time he said to Reb Mendel, he says, you know, I've been watching the guys and I've been watching you and I've been making theories in my mind. It's interesting when I'll tell you this, you'll think if you're familiar with Victor Frankl and logotherapy, you're like, hmm, it sounds very familiar. And I don't, I don't know if in the time that Reb Mendel was in prison, if Man's Search for Meaning was available behind the Iron Curtain. So I don't know if this guy had read Frankel or he came up with the same theory on his own. Frankel came up with it, or actually came up with it before Auschwitz, but then he affirmed it in Auschwitz. Perhaps this professor had a similar experience in the, in the gulags in Siberia. At any rate, he says to Reb Mendel, he says, you know, I see these guys, they're young men. And, and one morning, you know, they refuse to get up off the cot. They can't move. And we come back from a day of slave labor and they're dead. Young, healthy men who they didn't die from starvation or from disease. They, they, they just, they, they don't get up off the bed. And I think it's because they lost the will to live. But I don't get it because you, I see you're, you're also in prison. You know, it's not fun for you either, but you get stronger and you, you inspire everybody. You have a certain joie de vivre, this certain lust for life, this love for life that, 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 you, you spread to everybody. So he says, explain to me the difference. So the Mendel says, listen, let me explain something to you. He says, these guys that you're watching, dropping like flies, these are Cossacks. You know what a Cossack is? A Cossack is a low life. For a Cossack, life is three things. A horse, a rifle, and a bottle of vodka. That's life. Now, when they come to this place, that's taken from them. They don't have their horse, they don't have their rifle, and they don't have their bottle of vodka. So life is over, effectively. And it's only a matter of time before the body gets the memo from the brain, uh, buddy, you're dead already. And that's the morning you see them when they don't get up off the cot. And by the time we come back from the day of slave labor, they're dead. And Mendel says, but me, when they sent me here, what did they take from me? What did they take from me already? 
How's my life so different here than it was at home? Now, you have to understand something. The man didn't see his wife and children for 14 years. He, he was working as a slave. Okay, but he says, what did, they, what did they take from me? He says, my life's not so different. He says, back, back home, I'd work in the office. He worked in an office forging passports to get Jews out of Russia. That's actually what they, they got him for. That's why he was in prison. So I'm sitting in my office, and I see the sun's going down. It's time to daven mincha. You got to daven mincha. So you go to show you daven mincha. He says, over here, it's pretty similar. We're out chopping wood. And uh, see the sun's setting, and you have to daven mincha. Now, there's no shul to go to. Okay, you don't go to shul. And I can't actually stand there and daven, or they'll shoot me in the head for, for stopping work. But while I'm chopping the wood, silently, in my head, I daven mincha. And in fact, I think to myself, wow, you know, in all the 5,000 such and such number of years since Hashem created this earth, I bet you no one stood on this exact spot and said his praises. What a privilege that I'm able to serve Hashem from this spot. He says, so you see, my life's not so different here than there. Back home, I tried my best to serve Hashem. Over here, I tried my best to serve Hashem. What did they take from me? They didn't take anything from me. So that is the Baal Betochen, that what he's got, nobody can take away from him. Let's continue inside. Avil, to the contrary, not like the alchemist who's afraid that people will find out he's an alchemist, whom is poor boy. He's very proud. And by, by the way, pride is not a bad word. Conceit is a bad word. Proud is a good word. Jewish pride, right? Being proud of your soul, proud of your mission, your godly purpose on earth. He's proud that he has a relationship with Hashem. He doesn't have to hide it. It's not a secret. He's proud of it. Kemesha Amr David Amalekh Allah Shalom, like David Amalekh said, Belakim Batahti Laira Mayase Odumli. I trust in Hashem. I will not fear. What can a person do to me? They can't take anything from me that I've got because I'm getting it directly from the source. Okay. Number four, the fourth way that someone with betochen is better than someone who is an alchemist. Kibala Kamiya, Ene Nimlot, Mahazmin, Mehazohova, Kesev Harabel Ace Tsarke. The alchemist has no choice but to prepare either a large amount of gold and silver so that it will be available to him when he needs it, or alternatively, to only save up a little bit as he needs it. So it's actually he has to make a decision. Hmm, should I stock up? They said that the, you know back in March there's going to be a quarantine. I've got to go to Costco and, uh, and buy... Uh, Two truckloads of toilet paper, right? So should I hoard my alchemy stuff? Or, but then I, you know, I didn't have credit cards back then. So I'm going to have to buy, you know, then I won't be liquid anymore. I've spent all my money on alchemy stuff. So what can I do? Oh, maybe I should only buy a little bit of a time. Oh, but if I only buy a little bit of a time, maybe I'll go to the alchemy store and they'll be all out, right? Okay. So he's got that problem. V'im yazmin mimenu harbe, yia kol yomov mefached al nafshe shilo yevid mimenu b'minei sibe so aveda. But... If he does stock up, you know what he's afraid of? He's sitting on this stockpile of, of, of alchemy stuff. He's afraid someone's going to come and take it. He doesn't want to have that kind of stuff sitting around. It's like having, you know, cash around. You, you, know, you want to put that in the bank. You don't want to have that around. And his heart won't relax. He's also, his heart won't let, let him rest. He's going to be afraid of the people. He's going to be afraid of the king. The authorities are going to find him. His neighbors are going to find him. He's always sneaking around with his alchemy. But if he only prepares enough stuff to get by for a little bit of time, Maybe, like I said, they'll, they'll run out and then he won't have it when he needs it. So he's always worried about the scarcity and about have, having too much supply on hand, not having enough supply on hand. Okay. However, the person who trusts in God. His reliance on Hashem is so strong, he knows Hashem is going to provide his sustenance according to his will at whatever time and whatever place he wishes. So don't worry about it, you know? The same way the Abishter can send me my Parnosa here, he can send me my Parnosa somewhere else. It's not a problem. <laughs> Just like a fetus is sustained within the womb of his mother, 
v'afreyach b'seich ha-beitza, or like a chick inside of an egg. Asher ein bo mokim mefulash li konas elav mimeno davar mechutza. There's no open space for anything foreign to come in. V'ha'oif bo avir v'ha'dogim b'mayim, or like a bird in the sky, or like a fish in the water. V'ha'nemolo haktane im chlishusa, or even the tiny weak little ant. V'yibotzer ha-teref mehe'ori im tokpoi b'ktas hayami. And yet, at the same time, the big, strong, mighty lion, he could have his sustenance withheld from him. Kamesha Kosov, I guess Rabbeinu Bechaya likes this posik because I think this is the third time we've had it. Kfirim roshu barei evu v'der she'ashem le'yachsu choltev. Young lions, they roar and uh, are hungry, and those who seek out Hashem, who rely on Hashem, lack no good. V'amr, and it says, Lo yadiv Hashem nefesh tzadik, Hashem will not starve a tzadik. V'amr, nar ho'isi gam zakanti, v'lo yiroisi tzadik neza, v'zadim evakish lochem, I've been young and now I'm grown old, but I've never seen a righteous man forsaken or his children begging bread. Okay. Let's do one more, the fifth way in which the Baal Bitochin is superior to the alchemist, and then we'll be halfway through the alchemy portion here. Vachamishi in the fifth way. Shabal hakmiya techas yiro vafachad amalachde minagodol vadakotn shabaam. The alchemist, on account of his occupation, lives in fear and dread of everyone, from the king to the humblest of the people. Vahabeteach belekim. He's revered by the king and by the most respected of men. In fact, not just human beings, but even the stones, even the animals and the stones seek to do his will. Like it says, in the song in Psalms, in Tehillim, Yeshe B'Seser Elyeh, and if you look up that capital, capital Tzadik Aleph, Ad Achrisai, you read that whole thing through to the end, and it's speaking about how even inanimate objects, and even the animals, and the plants, and everything is basically taking care of the person. The Eimer B'Sheish Tzoreis Yatzileko V'Sheva Lo Yiga B'Chara B'Ra'ov Podcha Mimovis Ad Seifa Inyan, or like it says, in Eov, in the fifth chapter of Eov, um, he will save you. In seven, no evil will befall you. In hunger, he will redeem you from death. And it says a similar idea over there. Okay. At any rate, we are explaining how what people might fantasize as being the best solution to all my problems, an alchemist, I would have it made, okay? So that's in Spain in, uh, in, in a thousand years ago, in Rebbeinu Bechaya's time, that's what a person would imagine would be a real cushy life. That would be great, just to be a, an alchemist. And, and Rebbeinu Bechaya says, you want to know something even better than being an alchemist? And you can be it right now? Abeteich Basham. Okay, we're going to continue Mirza Hashem, with Hashem's help, on uh, Monday night, and we're going to find out more about why it's better to trust in Hashem even than to be an alchemist. Thank you so much for joining.